Hey everyone, my name is Brandon Seho, and welcome into the first ever episode of The Mental Game. This is a new mental health podcast with some of the biggest names in sports, music, and entertainment all joining me to help break the stigma surrounding mental health. Look, this is a project that I am passionate about because I battled depression and suicide for the past 15 years, so now I want to help give back, break that stigma, and help anyone out there that's struggling with the depression, the anxiety, those suicidal thoughts that I suffered from for so many years. This first episode is with Bengals defensive end Sam Hubbard. I covered Sam as a sports reporter here in Cincinnati for the past four seasons. Sam and I have become good friends, and I have to thank Sam for being the first ever guest. We shot this interview back in the summer during training camp before the Bengals season. But in this episode, we will talk about the Bengals' Super Bowl run, also Sam's own mental health as a NFL athlete. We talk about his journey to the Bengals from high school in Cincinnati to Ohio State where he played his college football, and now what it's like to be a veteran and team captain for a team that just played in the Super Bowl. Also, we'll touch on why he wants to give back to Cincinnati so much. Sam has the Sam Hubbard Foundation. We'll post a link in this description to that, but he does a lot of great work here in the Cincinnati area. Without further ado, let's kick off the Mental Game podcast with the first ever episode with Sam Hubbard. What's up, everybody? I am here with Bengals defensive end, defending AFC champion defensive end, Sam Hubbard. I appreciate you doing this, man. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Let's just start with this. You play for your hometown team. You take them to the Super Bowl. Walk me through the last year, what that was like for you. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been special. You know, I've been here. This will be my fifth season coming up, and the first few years were pretty dark and uh, a lot of adversity. And then, you know, you finally keep your head down and make it through. And, you know, kind of this past season was the light at the end of the tunnel, making it to the to the Super Bowl and really just the beginning of what we're, we've been building for a long time and uh, the sky's the limit for the future. Let's talk about those first four years or three years getting to this point. You obviously have a lot of pride for Cincinnati because you're from here, went to Moeller, went to Ohio State, now you play for the Bengals. How tough was that? Just You guys started out well your rookie year, I think started out 4-1, four 4-2, and one, four and two and then had three tough seasons in a row. How tough was it to kind of stay mentally in it or stay motivated when you're when you're losing a lot? Yeah, definitely. It was one of the hardest things, probably the hardest thing I've done in my career. Um, you know, being 0-11 does a lot to your mental, you know, trying to find that consistency to come into work, be the same person, work hard, and, uh, you know, kind of just grind through the adversity until you made it out. You know, you never know when it's going to come, when your break's going to happen. But uh, yeah, there was a there was a lot that went through a lot of you know tough times, you know looking everybody in your face. You have all my family and friends here mm-hmm. um, in Cincinnati that take a lot of pride in the Bengals and just coming home loss after loss while you're out there on the field. It's just it's a uh, it's a lot of weight on your shoulders for sure. And um, yeah, it, it was something that you know makes me who I am today. And uh, going through those dark you know tough adversity filled years has definitely you know given me perspective about where i'm at now and how quickly things can go the other way so be thankful for you know coming into work every day and winning games i was gonna say you probably felt it maybe more every guy on the team cares about winning and wants to win the coaches do too fans do obviously but you probably felt it more than most other guys you and kevin huber being cincinnati guys kind of seeing it and knowing it from growing up here yeah i mean it's just like i mean that first playoff game this past year everyone's like, yeah, we can win this game. And I'm like holding the weight of 31 years of curse over my shoulders. And I didn't tell them about it, but (laughs) I definitely felt a different connection to, to what we were trying to do on the weight that we were carrying, uh, you know, the curses and whatever, uh, that we overcame. So I would say it, it definitely did affect me a bit more than my teammates just from being, being from here. Yeah. Well, Joey B said 
we're not just here to win one playoff game yeah. when asked about that. And obviously, you feel the same way, but you have a better idea. Yeah, but of- I was like, Joe, no, you don't get it. You don't <laughs> understand what we just did. And it was just like another win to him. But, you know, that's, uh, you know, the mentality that he's got the mentality. It's hard for us not to adapt that. And that's just kind of what it is. All right. I'll ask about the Cincinnati curse then for sports. Which ones stick out to you? Were you more of a Bengals, Reds fan, UC, Xavier? Like what? What sticks out over your childhood growing up here? It was just the Bengals not winning a playoff game. You know, that that really was the one that, like, you know, no matter what happens, how good they are, they just can't win a playoff game. And that just stuck with me. Um, you know, they would have great seasons for a long time, mm-hmm. winning seasons, make it there, and then something crazy would happen. You know, <laughs> I was at the game. I remember being a kid at the game when Carson Palmer got his knee blown out in the playoffs, and it was like a – horrific you can't make it up core memory yeah you can't make it up it was awful well and then so you would have been at ohio state during the 2015 playoff yeah game? i wasn't paying as much attention i was kind of in my were, own world yeah uh, with the buckeyes but yeah i'm familiar with what happened yeah it's just you can't make that stuff up people who live here are from cincinnati it's pretty it was pretty impactful i mean i talked to a lot of you guys coach taylor after the game on the field and i, I think i asked you just you're going to the super bowl and you're like yeah, I'm going to the, you didn't say F him, but I'm going to the freaking Super Bowl. Like, yeah. it doesn't even seem real. Like, that moment to come full circle, how crazy was that for you? It was insane. You know, I look back now, it feels like 10 years ago. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it's all a blur. And, uh, you know, it's just something that we have under our belt moving forward. I've just turned 27. I feel like I'm not even halfway through my career in the, in the NFL. I got mm-hmm. a lot of football left to play and a lot of games to win, so having that under my belt in just my fourth year was uh, is something that I hang my hat on. I know you probably don't want me to ask about it, but the Super Bowl, when you know you were a minute 20, minute 30 away from, from winning the Lombardi Trophy and bringing Cincinnati that first championship since 1990, how do you look back on that game? Um, it's got to be motivating, but also you have to appreciate what you did that season, right? Yeah, I think it's just, it's just that. We appreciate no one expecting us to be there. Um, the guys that we played with, the plays that we made to get us there. I couldn't even tell you a single play from the play from the Super Bowl. You know, it's just like <laughs> something I've crossed out of my memory and just learned from. Uh, something I don't dwell on, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's cool to say you've been to the Super Bowl. It's even cooler to say you won one. So that's our goal. Yeah, and that sets the bar now. I mean, you guys have talked about it. Every team, every coach, every player says championships, but. You guys have been there now, so that you see it now, you feel like you can go do it, right? You right. have the roadmap. Yeah, and like it was like uh, almost uh, un- intangible or unachievable. You know, we never like we looked up one day we were in the Super Bowl, but now it's like you know that's very possible. And if we just stick to the script, and uh, there's gonna be adversity mm-hmm. this season, something's gonna go terribly wrong, and it's the teams that overcome that, stick together, all that uh, that make it there. So we're talking about adversity. Obviously, I'll get into the mental health thing, too. Um, speaking of just the outside noise, you probably tried to not let that get to you when you guys were playing bad and losing. Now, do you listen to the TV? Do you look at social media when people are saying, hey, they're a favorite in the NFC or AFC North or they can get back to the Super Bowl? Do you feed into that? Or how do you balance seeing both sides of it now that you guys have been to the Super Bowl? Yeah, no, I've definitely seen both sides. And one thing that I've learned is that this league will humble you no matter what. So... It's pretty amazing you have a good game you play one good week you're you know a couple sacks or whatever then you lose one game the next week and you go from being the top of the world everyone's talking about you to being what's wrong with them you know mm-hmm. and coaches jobs on the hot seat players should be benched it's a uh, it's a real up and down and you got to find a way to stay even keeled and I just don't listen to any of it because <laughs> you know What's going on in the locker room nine times out of ten, the dynamics or what situation we're dealing with is something that we can't openly talk about right. or uh, address publicly that you kind of have to handle internally. So uh, just handling that from a locker room, being a captain and all that is my focus. Basically, you're saying like sports players don't know anything. No. I mean, <laughs> in a way, you guys, you guys, you know. You we guys, try our best. Yeah, you try your best. But there, <laughs> there is some things that just can't be out to the public yeah. right well you, we talked about this before we started the podcast that play in kansas city the goal line stand to force them a field goal to go to overtime against the chiefs in the afc championship game walk me through that play where you're the spy and sack mahomes what 15 20 yards back 
that's got to be top of your list of plays, right? Yeah, it's probably my best play in my career. Um, taking us to the Super Bowl, basically single-handedly back-to-back saps. You can't even draw it up, but uh, they're going down. It was a 14-play drive. I didn't have a sub, so you know we we're all out there for 14 plays mm-hmm. straight. Literally just doing whatever we can. All they we needed to do was kick them to a field, keep them to a field goal. They score the game, score a touchdown, game's over. Right. So it's a, a bend don't break mentality, and everyone bowed up, and uh, I just happened to be the guy that made the play because I was put in that position. And uh, you know, I mean, a million plays were made. Jesse making the pick, Tip, Vaughn, yep. yeah, uh, Vaughn picking it off, Joe avoiding sacks. It's just like you just consistently just keep grinding and stuff like that happens well and as we're talking about mental health i just you talk about bow up i hear that a lot with you guys and just kind of that's got to be a physical and a mental thing just staying in the game let's shift to the mental health part of things and you and i were talking about it a little bit before kind of the routines you do and things you monitor but first like what what does mental health mean to you i mean i've you've seen athletes and other people open up i mean you kind of know my story the last Mm -hmm. couple years what does mental health mean to you uh, to me personally, it's just a never ending process. I would say that it's, uh, you know, working on your mental state, being happy, content, putting things in perspective is something that you never truly like conquer or like put in the past day by day. You just consistently work at it and you're going to face different challenges. You're going to be up one day, peaks down. Mm-hmm. You just got to uh, always be aware and do things that work for you to keep yourself where you want to be. And we talked a little bit before, before we started rolling, that you kind of do different things to make sure, monitor different things before games, after games, during the week, just to make sure that your mental health's right where it needs to be. Yeah, for sure. You know, whether it's taking a break from just social media, you know, you get a lot of praise one week after a big game and you're, you know, you're just thinking about that rather than, um, you know, going out there and playing or you have a tough week and you're just sitting there thinking about what people are calling you on twitter Mm -hmm. it's just added weight and uh energy that you don't need to expend but that's just one example you know i try and you know 10 minutes of meditation uh a day guided through like an app is something i've adopted later on in my career that's really been beneficial for me to stay uh you know keep your runaway thoughts from taking over and just stay present Mm -hmm. almost and that's one thing that's really helped me for sure what is something for you know younger athletes probably when you were younger in your career you didn't monitor or think about or i don't know if it was well we grew up with social media but yeah maybe you didn't know how lethal of a weapon that can be for fans and did you ever have to like kind of take a step away either in high school college is that when you kind of first started noting the social media how the way it is now with fans i think i'm like the first generate or first like really like the first uh, where I was recruited, everything with all the social media, and, yeah. you know, living with smartphones from like eighth grade up. Yeah. So I've always, you know, operated, you know, when I go out, I'm aware of phones everywhere. Some people, um, a bit older than me, like didn't have yeah. cameras on them when they would be doing anything. So I, I was just always, you know, in that age group and a I don't know what it is to be an athlete, college athlete, without social media and stuff. So just navigating that has been, uh, you know, it's a constant process. I, I take time. I'll delete the apps from my phone when I feel like I'm, you know, a little bit too overwhelmed mm-hmm. by the social anxiety of just social media. And uh, that helps me just to get that dopamine reset. Right. Re- realize it's just... It's almost like, uh, I don't even know, it's like a roulette, like you're just sitting there refreshing, you're like, what am I doing? Like, right. This is stupid. This whole TikTok thing is, yeah. I downloaded it like two months ago and I needed to delete it, I can't get yeah, off that app. Yeah, it's too good. It's literally the- <laughs> The algorithm, like yeah. you figure out everything you like and you're just sitting on it forever. Yeah, and you're just like, video after video, just like, <laughs> your brain's lighting up, I'm like, get the, like, you take it off for a little bit, then you're like, all right, this is what, like- there's real world out here. Right. Like nobody's actually thinking about what I'm doing. I don't need to tell everybody what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, well, let me ask about this then. Being a pro athlete and getting that fame and notoriety where people want to take pictures with you, people, you know, like your post tens of thousands of times and seeing that, was that an adjustment? I mean, you were a highly recruited kid out of out of Moeller, went and played at a high level at Ohio State. But I think your fame, if you care of me calling it that way, the last three, four years has gone up a lot. 
How do you deal with that? Was it weird for you at first, or are you just kind of used to it now? Uh, yeah, it's something I don't particularly like just because it's really draining. But then at the same time, you look at, you know, you're at the grocery and someone asks you for a picture and you look at how happy it literally makes their day. Yeah. Like, and if you just say yes and take the time to take a picture with somebody, be nice, it literally can change somebody's entire week, their day. So you just got to put it in perspective. You know, I could just dismiss them or walk away and, you know, I'd be fine. But then you do something and you look back and like, oh, I really like. That was a nice interaction. They're mm-hmm. so happy. So that's when I always just like try and say yes and be nice when someone recognizes me or something like that. Did you uh, ever have like players or coaches you looked up to that you got to meet in person and take a picture of like a football camp? I don't know if anything came up where you were able to meet like an active player or something like that. Um, I, you know, I ran into, <laughs> yeah, I have a bunch of them. I ran into Rudy Johnson, the running back for the Bengals, yeah. at a Halloween Express in Kenwood when I was in like <laughs> really random. really random. But I remember he giving me a piece of paper autographed, and I put it on my wall, and like it's still sitting there, and it's like just uh, a cool memory that yeah. I thought it was the cool, like the best item I owned at one point, and it's just crazy to put things. It's in still here somewhere. No, not this oh, okay. house. Back in my parents' house, somewhere yeah. in my room. Yeah. What? what how old were you then uh probably like sixth grade like i don't even know well that's got that had to stick with you then i mean the guy yeah, that wanted yeah. to play for the Bengals, and then you get to meet somebody randomly looking for halloween costumes yeah yeah you just ran in there me and my friends were in there chopping for our costume we're like is that rudy johnson we like swarmed them and obviously <laughs> like same thing that happens to me with kids now so it's just like you know it all comes for full circle yeah that's a pretty cool full, full circle moment um you talk about making people's days. I want to get into this a little bit because I know your background with the foundation and what you do for the community here in Cincinnati and abroad, but it kind of came from your family because your mom serves. She, mm-hmm. She's been a, a nurse at, is that at UC. Yeah, for like 35 years. Uh, she's a head nursing supervisor at uh, University of Cincinnati Hospital. And my sister is now a nurse uh, practitioner um, there at the ER too. How, how much did that, you know, kind of call to service kind of influence when you had this platform being able to give back to? Um, I think it's just something that the way I was raised, we always just brought up that way. You know, mm-hmm. I remember so many instances where my mom, like we would be driving by and there would be a wreck and we'd pull over and my mom would jump out and go assess the situation. Just like, and I'm sitting there like, mom, can we just go home? <laughs> like, but then you realize it's the right thing to do. Right. Um, you know, we used to, drive around downtown during Christmas time with like brown paper bag meals and hand them out. Mm -hmm. That was her idea and like her present for us to go with her and do that. Uh, So yeah, it's just the way I was raised, I guess. Last thing I'll really get into here then is the foundation. What you do with the Sam Hubbard foundation, you have, you have the folding tournament, you do a lot of stuff with the free store food bank. Can you just kind of people that might not be familiar, what do you guys do and what's your goal to accomplish here around Cincinnati? Yeah, so this is actually the first year the Super Bowl run brought us a lot of uh, funds. You know, a lot of people rallied behind the foundation and donated companies, people. And this past off season, we've really. Uh, I, her name's Lindsay. Sorry, my dog. I know we'll yeah. get him in here soon. <laughs> uh, Lindsay Reeser, who ran Marvin Lewis's foundations for years, and Macatel. I brought them on to be employees, mm-hmm. and they work for the foundation. And so this last five months, we've been working with programs throughout the city to develop um, our own programs that we can aid and fund. Uh, I don't want to spoil it. we got some announcements coming out right. about what we're doing with the money, but it's some really cool stuff about, you know, getting into inner city schools. Uh, I don't want to spoil too much. <laughs> But, but you guys have done a lot of good here between the free store. Actually, this bank, will come know, out in a few months, so I can say. Yeah, you, yeah. Go ahead. So we got uh, an idea for it's called Hubbard's Cupboards, and this program that's already in existence called Crayons Computers has identified mm-hmm. schools that you know kids the only meal they get is at school. Yeah. And uh, we're gonna get pantries partnering with local companies that will be fully stocked. They can go in there, get food, school supplies, whatever they need. We're gonna start in a few schools. And then uh, expand the program once it gets going. Also, have a pantry at the University of Cincinnati Hospital where my mom and sister works. That's going to be stocked year-round for families that have people getting um, care that have no food. They can go in there and feed themselves and get resources that they need to live a healthy life while they're going through a really tough time with someone being treated. So 
uh, backpack drives in the works, Thanksgiving drive, Christmas yeah, drive. Yeah, so we really are are expanding it quickly, and it's going to be a lot of fun. That stuff probably roll out this school year then in the fall is what you're hoping? Uh, this August is our backpack drive, um, but we just donated our first check to University of Cincinnati to fund that first pantry. That okay. announcement will be coming out before the season, oh, okay. and then uh, hopefully the Hubbard's cupboards will be going on this season cool. during this coming school year awesome awesome last thing i'll ask on here for any athlete that's coming up that wants to you know kind of follow your lead go play a high level college sport get into the pros what's the one piece of advice or it doesn't have to be just one but kind of the biggest thing you tell them when they're trying to make that road to get there yeah i mean there's a million different things you could tell somebody but I, what i've found is there's no way you can't earn a job keep a job, be respected, be a leader. If you're like, if you're the hardest worker, you're going to be mm -hmm. in all those positions. Um, nobody, you, know, you may not be friends with everybody, but everybody's going to respect you. If you go out there every single day and consistently outwork people, you know, people take notice of that and people trust you because of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've always just said that, like, just go out there and, uh, be the hardest working guy in any room that you're at and you're going to find yourself uh, in a position to be successful because people take notice of that. And I always <laughs> I may run myself into the ground sometimes, but I always try and be the hardest worker in the room. And uh, I think that's the only reason I'm here right now. So, yeah. Awesome. Good advice. I appreciate it, Sam. Yes, sir. Appreciate it.